Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for this great day, this great day to serve you and worship you. So glad that I'm in your house today with your family. I've been waiting all week to get here to be with them. Thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for this service time, this opportunity to declare your word and to create to the nations of the earth. I ask, Father God, that you would hide me behind the shadow of the cross that no man would see me, but they would hear you and see the Lamb of God and the sacrifice that you gave to us and that you continuously give to us through truth. Father God, I ask that you would bless me. I ask that you would anoint me. I ask, Father God, that unction would be upon me and that I would declare this word in a very, very wicked nation, that I would declare this word Father, in a time when people are resisting truth, they resist it. And I pray that your power and love and your compassion would break through every barrier. I honor you and I welcome you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen and amen. Again, I'm glad that you're here. I love each and every one of you. Again, those that are watching live, those that will be watching archive, I appreciate this house. I appreciate the comments that I receive, even the bad ones that don't know how to spell, I'm praying for you. There is a th program called Hooked on Phonics. You can get help for your addiction of not knowing how to spell and speak properly. Amen. And I am not the greatest orator on the earth, so I said all that very jokingly. But this message that I have this morning is going to be very strong, very powerful, and I pray very penetrating to the callous mindset of a nation that has fallen asleep and is comatose. And mostly it's church folk that stand in the way from truth being distributed properly because we are the truth bearers. We are the torch carriers. We're the ones with light and life. And we have an assignment, and that assignment is to declare truth to an untoward nation to a people that is wicked and perverse and crooked. And sometimes that job is not very popular. In fact, it rarely is promoted. And I bless the Lord for the opportunity to do this. Again, so many people write to us and say very kind things, and then there's those that don't. And again, I really don't care because all of it is fuel to continue to move in faith. Because if you have no resistance in life, you're not going anywhere. A parked car has no resistance against wind, tread, against concrete, against friction and wear and tear. But if a car is moving at great distance and great speed, then f there's all kinds of resistance towards it and friction. And that's what's happening in our country today. So this message is going to be very strong and very raw and powerful. I think it's going to be one of the most powerful messages I preached this year. And again, I say that and somebody says, you know, how can that be? Because the other one was powerful, blah, blah, blah. But I'm just telling you what the Lord is speaking from this pulpit, which is confirmation to many in the prophetic community, just not one, but many. You need to be listening to this. And what happens is we get into the normalcy bias syndrome to where it is another day. Our stock markets are, you know, somewhat okay. Our finances are okay. And we, we become very numb to the reality of what's happening to us. So God allows a message like this to be preached. And here's what the Lord spoke to me. He said, America, you have been exposed and the nations have called your bluff. A paper tiger living in an imaginary world, playing the king of the mountain. O oh, foolish nation and foolish people who pride yourself on luxury and success, your end is near. Bankrupt, bankrupt, bankrupt is the call of your soul, the echo of a hollow heart. Your schemes and devices to fool the nations are worn out and they are tired. The beast system awaits its day of revealing Soon the nations will gather on your shores to feast on what is left of an empty empire. Void of righteousness and void of me, you've wasted your inheritance and invested into a pagan system. Soon you will be paid your dividends and with interest your harvest of judgment will come. You've laughed and scoffed and mocked my prophets, but the evidence of truth is right before you. What will you do with it? Will you repent and call upon me or will you fall into the fires of calamity? Choose this day, choose life, for many are seated 
and comfortable on this final flight. Very powerful words. Again, as always, I encourage you to pray over them, to go back into the archives, to read them, and ask the Father what it means to you in this hour and what you should do concerning this word. One of the things we must be very careful about in this congregation and those that are connected to this ministry is to become numb to these warnings and just let them pass by without examining them and praying over them and saying, God, what shall I do with this? What should we do in the very hour in which we're living in? And how should I respond? Because the father had a question there. He said, what are you going to do with it? How are you going to act concerning these specific words? When I woke up this morning and it was my time of prayer to prepare for this service, the Lord spoke this title of the message to me. He called it the Hendingbird. The Hendingbird. Obviously, all of us know what this name Hendingbird produces in your mind and the thoughts and the images and what kind of reaction it produces within the suke of your mindset. When I heard it, I listened to the father and I was like, Lord, that's pretty strong, the Hindenburg. And he began to take me on a journey back into history, which is a prophetic parallel of where we are here in America today. As many of you know, the Hindenburg was named after Paul von Hindenburg, who was the second president of the Weimar Republic in Germany. He was also a German field marshal, and he is the one that promoted Adolf Hitler to chancellor. He also oversaw the Great Depression that took place. And some of you all know I've preached and taught on the Weimar Depression and how they would take big barrels and wheelbarrows full of money just to go to the store to buy a loaf of bread and necessities. It was a tremendous time of depression. It was also the right type of ashes and flames for a dictator like Adolf Hitler to arise. We all know the history of what took place. But the Hindenburg was named after this president. It was also called the LZ-129, which was the Led Zeppelin type, not Led Zeppelin. Someone says, yeah, I know Led Zeppelin. I had to throw that in there because I wanted some of my old rockers to go, yeah. It was a Zeppelin aircraft or air machine of its time. It was tremendous aviation, uh, powerful project that the Germans produced. And as you know in your history, that as this thing was developed, it was very, very uh, powerful. It had six engines made by Mercedes-Benz at the time. It was Delmer-Benz. And it had the ability to uh, cross the, the Atlantic in hours as opposed to days. Very, very powerful uh, airship that was, that was made. And one of the things that I found very interesting as I studied this is that in its design, it, there was nothing like it at its time. It had over 15 circus wheel, Ferris wheel types of metal frames that went from front all the way to the back. And it had Goodyear product that was placed around it to make a skin so that it could penetrate, it could keep from being penetrated by the radiation and by infrared and by the harmful rays of the sun. And as I paralleled and I looked at this craft and at the workmanship, the Lord was reminding me of America and how America has been built so strong and so fabulously architectural design from not only the foundations of our government, but even our very homes and our existence and our life. We live very well. If you've never been overseas like I have to many third world countries, you really don't appreciate carpet. And you really don't appreciate your lights not going out or your refrigerator going out or some other necessity, even the water to flush your told it. And so the parallel is amazing as you, you look at the design of the Hindenburg. It was designed to travel and designed to carry 
multiple people. Obviously, it had places to sleep in. And not only that, it had dining rooms. And it had an area where you could smoke. And had an area of a lounge where you could look out the big bay windows. The thing was so powerful and so awesome that you could take a pencil or a pen and set it on a writing tablet on its end and it wouldn't fall. That's how stable the Hindenburg was. There was nothing like it. Nobody designed anything like this before. It was a very powerful feat of engineering abilities. One other thing about the Hindenburg that I found was awesome was that it was so stable that when it lifted off, many people did not know they were off the ground until they happened to look out the window and they had already lifted I find that, again, a parallel to America of the ability to rise above storms that we have over the decades, to rise above disease and war and different attributes of the enemy throughout the time period of our history. Though we've been blackened and blued and we've lost a lot of blood, we've been a nation that seemingly has risen above all of the craziness. Can anybody say amen to that? But the fact is, as we look outside the obvious window, if you will, of observation, we can see outside the storm clouds are gathering and the craziness underneath us as we witness our nation going to hell in a handbasket. And so as we go on with this analogy of the Hindenburg, We know that it was traveling to America, and it had a lot of different travels. This was not its maiden voyage. It had traveled at least 62 other times to various countries, including Brazil. And on it, it had people like Nelson Rockefeller and other high, wheeling, powerful names. So it was not just a aircraft that was being tested, it had already been tested. It had already gone through some amazing battles, if you will, of flight. But yet it had one more flight that it had to take. In May 6, 1937, you all remember the story, that it was coming into Lakehurst, New Jersey, at the Naval, uh, the Naval Air Station, and it was going to make its landing And when it got to around 600 feet, it dropped its four ropes for those that would grab it and to steady it. And within four minutes of them grabbing their their ropes to steady this aircraft, this aircraft went into flames. And there was a man by the name of Herbert Morrison, a Chicago radio journalist who recorded the event. And these are the words that he said. It's starting to rain again. It's, the rain had uh, cracked up a little bit. They backed motors of the ship are just holding it uh, just enough to keep it from... The first time the flight. Get it started. Get it started. It's flying. And it's rising. It's rising. Terrible. Oh, my. Get out of the way, please. It's burning and bursting in the flames and, and it's falling on the morning fast. And all the folks agree that this is terrible. This is the one of the worst catastrophes in the world. Oh, it's just it's, it's, it's flaming. Plenty. Oh, four or five hundred feet into the sky. And it, it's a terrific crash, ladies and gentlemen. The smoke and the flames now. And the flames. I'm striding to the ground, not quite to the morning mass. All the humanity and all the fans are just feeding around it. I told you, I can't even talk to people who's been around there. It's, it's, it's a, oh, I, I can't talk, ladies and gentlemen. Honestly, it's just laying down mass and smoking wreckage. And everybody can't hardly breathe and talk and scream and lady, I, I, I'm sorry. Honestly, I, I can hardly breathe. I, I'm going to step inside while I cannot see it. <laughs> Johnny, that's terrible. <laughs> I, 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 listen, folks, I, I'm going to have to stop for a minute because I, I've lost the voice. This is the worst thing I've ever witnessed. The Holy Ghost had me play that because many of you remember that in history and back in school when you heard the recording of this journalist. And it brings back to my memory of 9-11, bring back to my memory of recent terrorist attacks in the nations of the world. So I played that because we're going to hear that again in the coming days, but in a way that will be in real time, the radio quality will be perfect. The recording will be perfect. It'll be live. It'll be in living color. It'll be live streaming throughout the nation and the world. What I'm referring to is the coming chaos to America 
the Civil War, the false flag, the economic collapse, you name it, you pick the poison. But we're living in a day at the very precipice of the hour of hearing these things. And so the Father wanted me to bring out this message about the Hindenburg and remind you of this great tragedy. 36 people died that day. And what was very amazing about this whole story, and I will enter into my scripture and where I'm going to preach from, was that the Hindenburg was called the Queen of the Skies. And that the Hindenburg was parallel to the Titanic. In fact, it was called the Titanic of the Skies. And the American economy and the American lifestyle and the current way that they are administrating authority over us is like the Hindenburg. It looks like we're sturdy. It looks like we're safe. It looks like we're earth built strong and air worthy. But the reality is that we're in deep trouble. And just like the crash, the explosion of the Hindenburg, it ended an era of airships. It never happened again. It was never duplicated because of the great trauma and the great destruction that the Hindenburg produced. Some say that it was due to ecstatic. Some say it was due to, say, Elmo's fire, which is a phenomenon. Some say that it was a false flag used by Hitler, sabotage, and so on and so forth. But the reality is this, that that bird, that big plane, that big airship, that zeppelin, it went down when they thought that it couldn't go down. I want you to go to Jeremiah chapter 17. I know you find that amazing this morning. Sorry to shock you. I know my introduction was a little long, but I really haven't finished my introduction. But I wanted to get that history into your spirit, into your mind, and to remind you of the Hindenburg and how that the Lord is using that this morning as a parallel of where we are as a country. I don't know how the recording went over for you, but for me, it gave me goosebumps this morning. I remember listening to it as a young man. And many times thereafter, I'm still young, by the way, regardless of what you think. <clears throat> and uh, I just almost broke out in forever young. Some of y'all was like, what? What is that? Never mind. <laughs> is that in the hymnals? Not at all. Not at all. In some churches, yeah, Maybe. Jeremiah chapter 17, the message is called the Hindenburg. It's a parallel to where we are. It's a parallel to where we are as a country. In Jeremiah chapter 17, I've been here before. But I have no problem going back again. Because that means somebody somewhere is not understanding the message. And I can tell by popular opinion and the way people are swaying and Leaning today concerning headlines and life and lifestyles, the message must be preached even louder, harder, and further it must go. So Jeremiah chapter 17, are you there? The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with a pen or the point of a diamond. The sin of America is an indelible mark upon our soul. There's no doubt about it. We're watching this nation go into flames as the Hindenburg did with our sin and our lust. Our lust for pornography, our lust for fornication and adultery. Whether it's in the White House or in the church house, there's a fire going on with men's hearts. The problem with humanity is the human heart. It's not legislation. It's not even the one running the nation. It's the problem of mankind, and I'll get with that in a moment. So he told me this morning, he said, the sin of America, it has been written with an indelible mark. I don't know about you, but if you've ever tried to unengrave something, it isn't easy. You're going to mess something up and to the blind eye or the na na naked eye, they can see that you tried to change it. 
But in America, we try to change the engravement of our hearts with religious garb and religious tunes and tones and attitudes to try to fake people to make us look like we have a form of godliness, but we deny the power thereof. And it happens in our common churches today when people walk into the house of God and they live any way they want to, but they dress real nice and real fancy and they put on their little religious mask. You know, the one you have in your glove department that you're wearing this morning. And they do it so wonderfully, especially on Christian television, because they want to fool you so you'll slide the plastic. But God said this morning that the sin of Judah or the sin of America is at a place of an indelible mark. I want to be clear, as I have for many years, that America will never repent. America will never be great again. America is never going to turn and metamorphosize into this wonderful place of fairy tale living that so many of us have grew up with called the American dream. I'm here to tell you that it's the American nightmare. Mayor. And I know that is kicking against the conscience of many who have been inundated and saturated with false hopes and false prophecies of those charlatans and Hananiah prophets who promise you and I a rainbow, but the only thing they ever deliver is the rain. Wish I had somebody to help me. And as I continue on my introduction, I want to be clear to everybody that listens to this ministry, I do not put my hope in a democracy, I do not put my hope in a federation, I do not put my hope in any type of government, I do not put my hope in Pennsylvania Avenue, I do not put my hope in the state house, I put my hope in Jesus Christ and him alone, the lamb that was slain from the foundations of the earth. Now, I know you have to have people lead you, but I am not putting my trust in men to the point where I blindly follow them over the cliff. And so I want to start out this message about the Hindenburg that you and I are living in a nation that will not change. It's not going to change. And if you didn't learn that from the election, I don't know what to tell you. But hopefully by the time I get done, you and I will see eye to eye. But I doubt it. Been doing this too long. Is anybody here? But I'm going to continue to preach this thing because maybe one will change their mind. It is a graven upon the tablet of their heart. Upon what? The table of their heart. Written where only the law of God should be. Is that right? The Bible declares that he's given us a new heart. He's taken away those stony tablets. He's given us a heart of flesh and he's written with his fiery finger, his love and the gospel and the promise of Jesus Christ. But it is very evident that this nation has a stony heart and the tablets have upon it the very names of their gods and their deities. Let me prove it to you. Grave it upon the table of their hearts, upon their horns of their altars. What he's alluding to, the great prophet Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, one whom I, I want to see after I go through my line of people. First of all, I want to see Jesus. I want to see the lamb that was slain from the foundations of the earth. I want to see the one who carried me when I should have fell through the very existence of life and busted hell wide open. I want to see the lamb. And I want to see Paul and King David and Moses and all the greats. I want to see Abraham. And I want to see Isaiah, and I want to see all the greats, excuse me, but then one day I want to see Jeremiah. He's probably familiar with Ignited Church, do you think? If heaven could hear right now. But the tables of their heart and the horns of their altar, Jeremiah was saying that left inside of the very core of their being and inside the very worship of their altars was the names of the deities. David, excuse me, Jeremiah was saying that there was no way there could be any erasing of it because they engraved it with the hardest material found in the hour. It was so deep and so carved in that there was no way to erase it. Oh, all things are possible with God. But God knew by his Holy Spirit, he revealed it to Jeremiah, they will not turn. 
And we know that because we've studied Jeremiah enough that he said that through the Holy Spirit that even if Moses and Samuel came, he wouldn't hear it. So they must have went through something pretty deep and pretty dark in order for God to deal them with them in such a way. And I believe that is the way it is here in America. And I know it's hard to penetrate callous minds that have been canvassed with the American dream like I was, thinking that one day I would inherit such a land of plenty and the fruited plains and we would have the life like leave it the beaver and my three sons. But I recognize and realize as I got older, that isn't true. I begin to realize that as I go further into my life, I am not going to have very much to hand off to my children in the realm of morality should the Lord tarry. And how many all could say amen to that? Even you grandparents, you shudder to think what the world will look like very soon. And so he said, it's upon your hearts, it's upon the tablets, it's upon the very altars, the deities to whom you worship. And we know in America we have all kinds of deities, though our churches have crosses on the outside and the man of God looks pretty religious because he's wearing a suit. And everything looks religious because we have singing and we have things about holiness and the cross and what have you. But the reality is that in the sides of our hearts, in the very sides, if you will, of our altars, we preach and teach another gospel. We live another gospel. We act another way. We don't act like the first church. We act like the pagan, backslidden, lukewarm, milk toast church that it is right now where we allow sin to be lived in like an open sewage. We, we allow unrighteousness to be in our homes and to be in our lives, to be in our entertainment. And we've placed these indelible marks in our heart. You all know it's true because you have family that thinks you're crazy, number one, to listen to me or go to this house. And think you're crazy for trying to walk holiness. How many of all ever tried to tell your family to live right? And they say, well, you know, I'm trying. I'm doing the best I can. It's just real hard out here. You know, and I, I just don't know if I can be as good as you are. The excuses continue to come out. And we know that there is an answer. It's called holiness. And it's called righteousness. It's called choice. It's decision. You can live right. In fact, it's easier to live right than it is to sin when you know God. I wish I had somebody help me. And so as I begin this introduction, I'm laying down these facts that our nation and our churches, unless we have a tremendous shaking, are not going to recognize the preaching that I'm preaching right now because we are being drowned out by the plastic churches and the commercial churches and the big box churches and the high-powered, high-paid, multi-million dollar ministries to whom I believe some are tied into the government B system to broadcast a mantra and an agenda to bring you into a place of robotic obedience instead of being the Berean that you should be and read the B-I-B-L-E. E. It's called the Bible, and that's the book for me. And find out what does the Bible say instead of being mechanical and robotic to do your head up and down just like everybody else. Sometimes you need to look at a preacher and go, I don't think so. Is anybody here? Sometimes you need to look at that television station and that television camera and that television program and look at your elected officials and say, uh-uh, something wrong with you. We're watching it right now, and don't worry, I'll get there. So he says in verse 1, he says it's like that graven image. It's on your altars. It's on your heart. You've, you've caused this engraving to take place, and it's happening right before our very eyes. I've never seen a time in church history where it's hard to tell the difference between a reality show and church. It's hard to tell the difference between the gossip of the pastor sleeping with everybody. I wish I had somebody help me now. With his secretary, I mean secretary, and all the other drama that takes place within the house of God. It's hard to tell the difference between that and some type of Big Brother episode. I'm, I'm about to preach. I'm just really taking my time. I got some visitors. I'm trying to be cool. 
You know that ain't true. But I'm warming you up because I got something to say to you. I got something to say to America. We are the Hindenburg. We are that great aircraft, if you will, that airship that seems like it can travel on and on and on and a great architectural feat, a great uh, mechanical factors of, of, of great engineering. But the reality is this, that if we don't have God in our lives again, if we don't have God in our hearts and our minds, if we don't have God in our church and our politicians and our policies, then we are a nation that is undone. And we are undone as a nation. Go to verse 2, if you will. Whilst their children remembered their altars and their groves by the green trees upon the high hills. Again, this speaks of idolatry. This speaks of going to the high places. Be careful of high places. Be careful of high positions of authority. If it's not clean, the rest is dirty. You better know who labors among you and over you. You better know your officials before you start promoting them and parading them as saints. You better know who they are. And that's one of the problems we're in right now is we promoted people in high places because we've been told by the Dr. Dumbbells of the evangelical community that so and so and such and such is good for the nation and this is the way we should go and, and that there's redemption and salvation and the God of second chances and on and on the excuses have gone. But the reality is if you have a marred vessel, you have a marred vessel. And I will clarify that right shortly. Was their children among, among them? They remembered. They remembered all these things that their parents did. They remembered the sin and the, the idolatry. And that's happening today in America where we have our children that are being raised up in a rebellious way. In a way, they don't have desire for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They don't have desire for the house of God. They don't have desire for righteousness and holiness because they're being taught by a bunch of pagans. They're being led into Babylonian captivity, first with their minds, second with their bodies. We're living in a cesspool where no leadership is really found because all we have are those that are living in the flesh all around us, whether it's a preacher or whether it's the president of the United States or whether it is someone in high position and power. We're watching our leadership decay and decompose right before us, even though we are a promise a saint. Can anybody feel me now? Hang in here. I'll make you mad if you're not mad yet. I got about another hour to make you mad. Watch this with me. Here's the problem. If our children that we're raising up now is an inheritance unto God, the Bible says that what? That the fruit of the womb is an inheritance. It's a heritage to God. If we're not giving him anything worthy of a future, then what kind of future do we have? I'm not talking about just the way you upbring your children or your grandchildren. I'm talking about righteousness in general and a society that is developing a bunch of hellions and rebellious young people because nobody will stand up whether it's in the schoolhouse or in the church house or your own house to say this is the way it's going to be it's my way or no way come on somebody or the highway and stand up in love and say i love you little johnny but you ain't going to act like a devil no more we don't do that anymore because we say hush hush don't hurt their little feelings we don't want to stunt their growth I'm about to take this jacket off. We don't want to stunt their growth. We don't want to cause them little issues, the little minds to get warped. So we put them in a little room with all kinds of devil games and all kinds of iPads and iPods. And we let the, the world influence their little minds to make them worse than they were when you told them to sit down and shut up. Oh, some of y'all don't remember how you was raised. Some of y'all forget how it took a strong hand and a strong eye and a strong mouth and a strong heart to say to you, don't do that. And let me give you some boundaries so you don't fall and turn into something worse. 
But see, we've lost that today in America. We've lost that reality of lifting our children up. And so we train them to be like us. We train them to act like we do. We train them to be friends with us because, you know, we want our children to be friends. Let me tell you something. I respect my father and my mother because they laid the law down, not because they were my buddies. In fact, I don't ever remember hearing my mama or my daddy call me friend. Y'all help me out now. The only time I heard friend was you ain't going over to your friend's house. Somebody waving me like you got a pulse. You know it's the truth, but it's changed and it's not the times and we're just trending and we're just listening to Dr. Spock. That's not Star Trek, by the way, for the millennials. Uh, some of y'all need to know who Dr. Spock was. He put in some demonized teaching that have caused our children to find time out when they should have been wiped out. <laughs> Somebody better help me. Somebody better help me. I'm going to get a letter on that one. But you know it's the truth, and we've changed. It's not that we changed and we trended that we found a better recipe, honey. There's only one way to make biscuits the proper way, and that's the original way as far as I'm concerned. You can keep your nutmeg and all your other stuff out of it. Just do it like Grandma did and make some good old butter milk biscuits. But the reality is we try to change it and let's throw this in there and let's throw that. And we took the word of God out of the formula, out of the mixture of parenting. We took it out of our marriages. We took it out and we allowed Oprah Winfrey and some other person and some other uh, doctrine of devil to come in and tell us how to love our wives and, and how to love our husbands and how to have a good family. And it has caused leaven to come into our lives. And America is full of leaven. America's full of sin. America and the church is full of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. To our preachers are not whole. They're mixed. They don't have the original ingredients of a disciple and of an apostle and a man and woman of God. They're mixed. They got a little bit of feminine in them. Someone, but I didn't say cinnamon. I said feminine. Got a little bit of candy, cotton candy on the side, a little sweet here and there. Instead of being a man or a woman of God that God created you to be. I'm getting some looks, so I know I'm doing good. It's the truth. It's the truth. It's hard to find a man today. It's hard to find a man today in the house of God or in the house outside of this place who will stand up and be who he's supposed to be and lead the house. The reason why most women stand up and take a position of a Deborah and a position of authority in the house and come become borderline Jezebel is because they can't find a man to lead them and bring them into the place of order and authority. Ladies, you know that's the truth. You can't lead from an armchair with a remote stuck to your body. Life is not a remote. Don't worry, I'm not going to do a marriage class, but I'm here to tell you the problem with our children, the problem with our nation is that we have gone so far south and away from the word of God that we're allowing people with philosophies and doctrines of devils and new age spirits to teach us how to train our children when the word of God says how to do it and how we're supposed to have our marriages and the way we're supposed to have leaders around us. And we have gone ahead and compromise and embrace the world to now we accept accept anybody in the White House and we accept anybody behind the pulpit. We, we accept anybody to walk in our house as long as they love us. Y'all ain't helping me singles. And all we do all this so that we can feel included and we can feel wanted instead of waiting upon the Lord to give you the right thing at the right time. I know I'm telling the truth. I can feel the resistance. But our children, they become little devils, not little Debbies, little devils. To the point when a 17-year-old boy by the name of David Hall could stand up before 500,000 people in Washington and multiplied millions around the world and call for a revolution in our country when we can't find many preachers to call for a revival in our country. Oh, that's a good place to run around. 
that's a good place to run around. 17-year-old boy who tries to castigate and navigate our nation and teach us a lesson when the reality is if you don't see this, you're just blind and living upside down on a post hole. This thing was scripted from day one. Day one, this thing has been scripted. And to raise his fists and call for a revolution and have the very president of the United States say, I agree and support, in of itself is a travesty. And it is also very sad for us to see in our American eyes in this day. Because what you don't understand is not only this 17 year old socialist communist revolutionary he's not only calling for the end of gun violence in which i stand and agree i'm finished with reading about bloodshed i'm finished with reading about children being shot i'm finished with hearing about murder suicides in chicago and in baltimore and the craziness of charlotte and miami and los angeles and other cra places with craziness abounds i'm all for the ending of that but if you would read deep into the understanding they're not all not only calling for the end of violence they're calling for the end of the second amendment that's socialist, that's communist, and that is revolution, and Fidel Castro is rolling over his grave saying, yay. Is anybody with me? I'm not against youth. I'm not against empowering youth. But when it's been scripted and somebody has been promoted up into a position to tell the nation the way that it should go, which is opposite the way the Constitution reads, I have a problem with, and I have to say something from this pulpit. I am for the Constitution. I am for your right to bear arms. I'm for your right to say something. The problem is not the laws that need to be made. The problems are the laws that are there. The problems, we have a crooked government. The problems, we have unanswered questions about what took place on that day in Parkland, Florida, including military personnel in the building. Is anybody here? And don't you find it kind of strange that Kennedy died in Parkland Hospital and we have another mystery at the Parkland High School, I, I, Parkland, Florida. I just find all that stuff very interesting to me. And I think it's a word play that the Illuminati and those in high places like to play with you and I, and very few see it because we're so numb behind the ears. And we listen to this and we see this great crusade of young people. And oh, by the way, they were busting there because ain't none of them got no money to get there. Hey, listen to me now. Take a moment and look at the great picture. Look at the reality of this thing and think as Americans for a moment. All of a sudden, this thing just springs up out of nowhere. It's completely organic. They already have a spokesperson, and the spokesperson is speaking communistic, socialist, revolutionary words. And we sit there and we look at it and agree and have our own president and people in high places agreeing with this mob of people who are trying to destroy the Second Amendment and bringing us to a place of socialism and decay. This is no different than the Communist Manifesto that was made back in the 50s, of which I've preached from many times from this pulpit, about how they're grinding down America, and this was a false flag attempt to do it, and I promise and prophesy to you there will be another, because Parkland was not enough. There will be more bloodshed in our schools to get to where they want us to go. But I look at verse 2 and I see that we've trained this generation to be godless. You say, how do you know? Because 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1 through 5 said that in the last days there would be perilous times. There would be peoples that will be proud and lovers of themselves and covetous and disrespectful to parents. Can I preach this? Am I okay? Or you got somewhere you need to go. So we watched this thing, a 17-year-old pimple-faced young man who probably didn't have a car to get there, 
stands up before the nation and the world and tries to tell us how that we should live when the facts on the ground are contrary to the scenario we're being fed. I admit it and I stand in total agreement that we have a problem in America, but the problem of America is not guns, it's the human heart. It's the human heart that's the problems. If you don't know that, then go to Australia where they're still stabbing folks. Because if the communists and the socialists had it their way, we'd be all like cavemen walking around dragging our knuckles with sticks. And even those things they would try to ban from us. Stick is bad. The reality, if a man wants to kill you, all he needs to do is grab you by his hands and grab your neck and choke you to death. If you ain't never been married, you, ain't, you don't know nothing about looks either. My wife has laser eyeballs. All she got to do is look from the kitchen and I could be in the garage and get zapped. How many married men say, oh me? Those that have been there say, woo wee, glad it ain't me no more. I haven't witnessed anybody. <laughs> Live stream, they're going, yeah, man, preach it. But that is a reality that we're facing today. And that reality is that we have disobedience taking place in our children. We have disobedience taking place in our nation. We're not raising them up in the proper way. We're wanting to go the way of communism and socialism. And the church of Jesus Christ is so asleep. And the average Christian is so asleep. And they're drinking the Kool-Aid. Man, we've gone from shot glasses to big old mugs, man. And we are chunking this thing down. We're saying, yeah, feed us some more because we don't really care man as long as our money's doing good as long as sports is taking place we yeah we agree with you let's go for it we elected a president in this country that was to be pro second amendment we're watching that he's not pro second amendment i knew it'd get real silent because we're watching the mask come off. We're watching the emperor's clothes come off as the word, the word of the Lord came from this church many times. And we're seeing the nakedness of who this person really is. And I have been praying and praying and praying that God would expose President Trump for who he is. Can I just, can I just do this? I'm just going to do it anyway. I'm just going to say it. I'm all, yeah, get people mad. I was going to do it. Let's just do it. Let's just rumble. We got a Bob button now, 20, 30 minutes. Can we duke it out for a minute? I'm just going to do it because I'm going to tell you something. The Hindenburg, that's America. We're going down in flames. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm not going down voluntarily. I'm going to go down swinging. I'm going to go down with truth. I'm going to tell everybody, you better get on a lifeline now. I'm going to tell everybody, you better get on a lifeboat now. You better stop putting your trust and your hope in a political entity. I've been saying it. Listen to me now. I was talking to a prophetic friend the other day, and I said, listen, I said, I'm praying so hard for the exposure of our president and the exposure of the watchmen that are lying. Let me tell you why. First of all, I don't wish anything evil on anybody. I'm telling you, if you look through my heart and come to my house and hear my private conversation, I just want everybody to leave me alone. Not talking church, folk. You go on to the house you want to, just bring some biscuits or something. I just want the world to go away. I just want them to quit fornicating everywhere. I just want to quit hearing about all kinds of sex scandals. I want to quit hearing about going to war and bloodying this guy's nose and a president and the vice president duking out like two grumpy old men. You don't want to read the insanity. Don't you get tired of all this? The Kardashians of the White House, the Kardashians of the elite. I get sick and tired. I just want to be left alone. I want to pay my taxes. I want to pay my tithe. I want to love my family. I want to love my church. I want to preach. I want to have a glorious life. I want to enjoy my future. I want to see my children's children. I want to see all these things. But the reality is we ain't getting none of that because of what's happening. And somebody has to stand up and say something because a lot of people are going to get hurt and a lot of people are going to die 
the Hindenburg. It's not going to land safely. This will not land safely. The USS Titanic will not land safely. We are not headed into better shores and better waters and better harbors of a better day. We're headed into all kinds of crisis and chaos and tribulation according to the word of God, not the word of a man, but the word of God. And I don't want anybody to say, you didn't warn me because your blood won't be upon this preacher and it won't be upon this house. I'm warning you, the house is on fire. You better get out of the house and make preparation for your family. Feel good in this Catholic church this morning. By the, word, by the way, don't write me. Catholic means universal. It's insanity. Sanity, you say anything of this pulpit, people are right. You say, me, me, me. So why don't you come to my house and tell me that? I got a couple of Rottweilers waiting on you. Is anybody here? You can cut that out if you want, Joshua, but I'll probably tell you to leave it in. It's insanity what's going on, and we watch this, and we see our, our officials doing all these crazy things, and our children are learning the same. You say, how do I know? How do I know is because our president going around using the F word everywhere. Wait now. Where's all my St. Trump people at? Where's all my St. Trump people with your St. Trump necklace? I don't see you. Walking around effing this and effing that in private conversations and being caught by people and then the people leaking out saying this is really who this cat is. That's why there's leaks in the White House because people are trying to expose him. And all I want out of this whole deal is for you, Mr. and Mrs. Rumpelstiltskin, to wake up out of your sleep and slumber and your comatose comma, coma to recognize and realize the hour that we're living in and shake yourself free and read the Bible. He is not King Cyrus. You got it all backwards. You don't understand the hour that we're living in. You don't understand Bible. And you trust these guys to tell you. You say, how's that correlate with this young guy, David Hogg? Because he got up on television and he did an interview and he used the F word several times. And I had to watch it. I heard the one F word and I shut it off and I said, I got it. 17-year-old potty mouth child telling the world F and telling parents that they don't know nothing about democracy. Go look it up and find out for yourself. That's what 2 Timothy said would be disrespectful. Where was mom and daddy to go rip that boy by the nap of his neck and take him into the room and lay him over their lap and whip that 17-year-old butt? <laughs> I can't believe he said that. Come on now. Or tell him the interview's over and I double dog dare you, I'll sue you if you let this interview get out. Is anybody with, where's our common sense anymore? But we sit there and we use that energy and they use that energy, that spirit of antichrist. And we say, yeah, we got to make a change in America. Yeah, we got to follow this revolution. Instead of reading between the lines and the reality of what they're trying to do. And they're trying to destroy America. Because I'm telling you right now, if they're willing to take the gun, they'll take the book. Brother, if they'll take the gun, they'll take the book. They'll take that B-I-B-L-E out of your hands because this is the most dangerous weapon in the world. This is the greatest weapon in the world. This is called the truth of God. And many dictators have gone to hell because they failed to bring this truth with them. Because this Bible gives me freedom to speak. This Bible gives me freedom in a prison cell. This Bible gives me freedom anywhere I go. This truth is freedom, and it's the greatest weapon that any man or woman could ever have. We need truth in the inner parts of our heart again. And I would choose this word over any weapon made by man any day. But the reality is, is that I have the right to do what I've been given to do according to the Constitution, which is based upon the Word of God in many ways. But I'll be blessed. I'm going to allow a 17-year-old child to tell me what I can and cannot do in this United States of America. I'll be blessed. Especially with a potty mouth. And you ought to be ashamed, you media mongols and all you stars and all you presidential people and, and all you high places that allow this type of tripe to be spoken to the American people. How dare you? 
but you ain't no different than they are, and that's why it's allowed, and that's why, Christian, you're guilty for supporting this type of junk that's coming out of this White House. You say, Pastor, what would be the alternative? I do not know, but the Bible said this whole thing will fold up. This whole thing will end. This whole system will cave, and it's already happening right before your very eyes. You're just watching it. I'm not asking for it to speed up. Are you crazy? I'm not a son of thunder. I don't want to call fire down from heaven. Like I said, I just want you to leave me alone. I just want to love God and love my family and love life and love my church. I don't want to see bombs coming down. I don't want to see the armies of the north invade us as they will. I don't want to see the antichrist beast system in my lifetime, but I will. And so will you. It's insanity. But yet we, in the evangelical community, we receive this and we say, okay, this is fine. This is wonderful. You know, we're just going to give him a second chance. He made a mistake and, and so on and so forth. But we watch the exposure take place. We watch it continuously before our eyes. And I wonder when some preacher will stand up and say, church, please wake up and stop following a man. Stop following a false dream and a false hope and false prophecies and get your nose back into the word of God and start preparing for the end times and start preparing preparing for, for society to go insane. Because I'm going to tell you something. They thought, they thought Noah was a freak. And they thought that Noah was crazy. But I'm telling you, the life we're living right now is upside down. Again, I don't have anything against anybody. I don't have no political agenda. I promise you I'm not running for office. Even though the last election I got one vo vote, that wasn't bad. I didn't think that was bad. <laughs> I might try again in 2020. I don't know. I'm thinking about it, praying about it. Anybody here? I'm not against any of these things, but what I, what I am against is our churches being led asleep and led astray by the Dr. Dumbbells who told us that we are evangelical gnats because we didn't support this man. I told you from day one, God told me in this pulpit, day one, when they came after the election, that they did not elect a Reagan, but a pagan. And I got letters from people, and they got all mad and crumpled up fists, and they almost ripped their crucifix off their chest. Y'all catch that later. You get it? And I stood to it. Even though we had all these prophecies and all these things were coming out, and everybody was like, man, look, this thing's been signed, and this thing's been signed, and this, being, this, all this is wonderful. And I kept saying it's a facade, and nothing really true will happen until there's a repentance of a heart. But how can you have repentance of a heart of a person who says, I don't have to repent? I'm just, I'm just giving you facts. But people get all mad and they say, don't give me facts, man, give me fantasy. As you all know, just the other day that a $1.3 trillion budget was signed into law. Listen to me, church, please. This is the Hindenburg. We are not financially stable. We are in wreck and ruin. In fact, that we are broke. Just because you got a little money in your pocket and digits on your account does not mean it is stable and it does not mean that the nation is stable. It just means God's blessing you. And you better use wisdom with what he's given you. You better invest it in other things besides currency, which is fiat and nature and is subject to decay and war. 1.3 trillion dollars that now surpasses us to the 22 trillion dollars in debt. I thought we were going to make America great again. I thought that we were going to break the back of debt. I thought that we were going to live in this glorious time where everybody's going to have a Cadillac in the front yard. Come on, somebody. It's a ribeyes in the oven. The reality is you might have got a little bit of a raise, but we have just signed our death warrant to not only this generation, but to the following generations. And we have just entered into a trade war that we will never win. History proves to us that every time you start a trade war, the next is a shooting war. 
Russia just warned us that if we do another false flag chemical attack in Syria, you say another? Yes, I said another because we've been involved in at least two of them. That they would react against us and they would strike America. Is anybody alive on this Palm Sunday, this Palm Sunday? Because the reality is this is right before us and we are defenseless against the Russians and the China, Chinese now. I know your news guy won't report this, the guy with the hair plugs, who smiles all the time, there's a death and something bad going on, they still smile and give you the sports. But I'm going to tell you something, China and Russia have already developed supersonic uh, uh, missiles that I told you in this pulpit that they can use against America and we are defenseless. That our nuclear capabilities are basically obsolete. And they are over at least 18 years old since they've been maintained properly. That's 19, was it 1992 or somewhere in there? Some crazy number. We're in trouble. We don't have enough of our nuclear capability to defend ourselves against Russia and the Chinese. We used to have a policy that we would mutually destroy one another. Remember that growing up? It doesn't work anymore. Because our statistics are so low in percentage of how many Russians we could actually kill compared to how many they could take out here in America. Don't you find this very strange, church? This is Bible. You're living Revelation days. You're living the days of what God said would be in the last days. And because we thought we had a Trump, uh, we had a, a saint, we had a prophet, as he's been called, in the White House, wouldn't you think all this would go away? No, it's going to continue until judgment hits this nation in a greater realm. $1.3 trillion signed. And you know what the president said? He said, I'm going to veto it. That was a fake veto. He knew he was going to sign it. Why? Because he dropped an F-bomb in the White House. And he said, there's no effing way I'm going to take responsibility for the government being shut down. You can hear a pin drop in this monastery. But that's the born again guy. That's the man of God in the White House. That's the prophet that all you preachers have been saying that is standing there trying to lead us into the promised land. No, you're a liar. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth of a man speaks. And I'm tired of hearing it. I'm tired of taking my children out of the room and telling them to cover their ears because of what's being said in the news. And I regret that I even have to say it from this pulpit, but there's so many people that are numb. There's so many people that are getting this message that friends are sharing with their families and they're trying to wake them up to recognize and realize that we're in deep trouble, that your great white hope is not going to be there. You need the great hope of Jesus Christ because he'll never change. And he's not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. He don't curse like a sailor. Some of y'all are going to learn tonight on, tonight on 60 Minutes more of what you put in there. If you can stomach to watch it. Can I go on just a few more minutes and get your stomach real messed up for lunch? Not only, not only did he sign the $1.3 trillion budget that said it was for the military, wink, wink, hint, hint. But he also fully funded Planned Parenthood with $500 million, folks. Fully funded it. Where's the outrage for the Christians? Where are you, Dr. Jeffries? Where's your whole church? Why don't you march up to the White House and do like these people did, these young people did? And why don't you get all your evangelical gnats with you? And let's protest this president for signing a bill that he said he never read. Is anybody alive today? Does anybody have jello in their head? Because we got a president who's supposed to be a tremendous businessman, multi-billion dollar, dollar guy who didn't read it? You guys, you may, I, I just want to run around. I want to run around. That's all I want to do. Just run around going, ah, you guys are crazy. I'm not the crazy one. You're crazy. Multi-billionaire has signed more contracts than you probably blown your nose. 
and said I didn't read it. 2,200 something pages. Come on now. Where's all the earth huggers saying you killed the trees? <laughs> See? All the environmentalists should be running with tree figs and leaves and you have to laugh at this, you're going to blow a gasket. Never read it, but he signed it. Didn't Nancy Pelosi say that one time about a bill? We got we to gotta sign it to read it. We got to sign it and read it and find out what's in it. Then your president says it, and you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. That's my man. She's going to buy rah, rah, rah. Instead of somebody grabbing the chain and yanking it and saying, what in the world is going on up there? I told you where there's confusion, there's every evil work. Said it last week or the week before. And we got confusion in the White House that's done by design. It's all scripted. You're watching a series of Big Brother. You got a hidden camera and it's all scripted. And they're all doing what they want in this room called the White House. And you just eating ice cream and the popcorn just to join it saying, that's, I'm rooting for him, man. I'm rooting for Don John. You ought to be mad. Not mad at me, but people get mad at me. You ought to be mad at you that you got, you got duped. You got fooled. America got fooled again and the church got raped again. I told you it was going to happen and I told you it was happening the whole time. Don't you remember mom and daddy saying, they ain't good for you. I love them. Come on, somebody. Don't you remember mom and daddy said, I'm telling you, I don't think that person's going to be good for you. Six children later in a divorce court, they were right. <laughs> Come on, man. President's supposed to be Second Amendment. By the way, this isn't anti-Trump day. This is just truth. I'm just giving you truth. Can I do that? I did this about Obama. I do it about anybody. Y'all know that I'm an equal opportunity offender. But when truth is out there, now they're going to ban bump stock. Now anything that makes a gun turn into a machine gun is now going to be banned by this president. As far as I know, in Parkland, there wasn't bump stock used. Why? Because automatic weapons were used by our own government. The last place bump stock was used allegedly was in Las Vegas. Is that right, folks? But all of a sudden, now it comes to the forefront, it's going to be banned? You see, this has to be brought out to the American church because you're being lied. And if you're being lied to on one little thing, you're being lied on a whole nother level and a whole nother scale. And it's very dangerous. We're living in a very dangerous hour. Verse 3, I'm going back. O oh, my mountain in the field, I will give thy substance and thy treasure to the spoil and the high places for sin throughout all thy borders. He said, because of your sin, I'm going to cause your enemies to take hold of you. I'm going to cause them to have the right to do what they want to do. I've already mentioned to you about Russia threatening America. That's one thing if the Bahamas threaten you. It's a whole nother thing when the Russians threaten you and when they're taking the moral high ground in this very hour of us living in unrighteousness. He said, I'm going to deal with you. I'm going to take your places of plenty. I'm going to take your highlands, your places of benevolence and protection and all these things I gave you because of what you've done with the children and because what you're doing in the nation of Judah Again, the parallel is America. Did you know that in one school, <laughs> I got to laugh at this, I'm going to read this to you, but in one school county in Pennsylvania, by the way, Pennsylvania, love you, but they have found an answer to stop terrorism and shooters in their classes. You ready for this? This is, this is a work of a brainchild. They're going to get five-gallon buckets, and they're going to put river rocks in it, and every room will have river rocks to throw at the terrorist. Let me repeat that again, because some of y'all are still trying to swallow. In Scully, Scully Kill County, I probably killed that name. Where in the world is that? I don't even know. 
in Pennsylvania, the superintendent said, we're going to put five-gallon buckets with river rocks in every classroom, and if there's a shooting, start throwing rocks. Folks, I didn't make none of this up. I mean, so what are we going to ban? Bump rock? I mean, what are we going to ban next? River rocks? <laughs> I mean, you got to laugh. What are we going to do? And do you think the terrorists are going to go, oh, my God, don't, don't throw a rock? I would choose lead over rock any day of the week, by the way. Do you see where we're headed? Do you see the craziness? We have it in the White House. We have it in our schoolhouses. This is absolutely insanity. I got, I got other things I can't even read. I'm out of time. I can't read them. This is crazy. This is the Hindenburg. We are going down, folks. Every man for themselves. Get off the ship of fools. Get off this craziness and stop paying attention to all of these charlatans and these false prophets and these Hananias that are telling you seven years of glory. If we're going to have seven more years of rock throwing, eh, listen, this lady the other day put her dog in the oven and cooked it because she thought her ex-boyfriend was inside the dog. I'll teach you. Yeah. Now we're going to have PETA marching on the White House. Do you see this with me? How can family members be so blind still and people in the house of God be so blind when you watch this craziness and you hear this craziness and everything I told you is documented fact. Go look it for yourself if you dare. You just ain't got a preacher who's got a backbone to stand up and love you enough to tell you the truth, but I will. I'm not following this crazy train because I'm going to tell you something that's headed to the abyss. It's headed to a place that most Americans, let me tell you, when this shock wave comes, the reason why the Holy Spirit had me re do that recording, because that's what we're going to hear over the loops and loops of 24-hour cable news of what is coming to America. It will shock the strongest man and woman in this room and listening to me right now. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, including myself. But I am doing everything I can to prepare my family in this church and those that love me and connected with this ministry. When this Hindenburg starts to come down and it catches fire, it'll be too late for you. One NASA engineer looked at the recording, the best that they had at the time of the videos, and his estimation was around 20 seconds, 18 to 20 seconds. The Hindenburg was caught on fire and came down. What is coming to America, you're not going to have time for. Those that were in the towers in 9-11 did not have time to do the next thing to rescue themselves or to prepare for that day. It's coming to America. Finally, in verse 4, And thou even thyself shalt discontinue from thy heritage that I gave thee, and I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in the land which thou knowest not, for you have kindled a fire in mine anger, which shall burn forever. Babylon, that is America. We're going to burn. We're going to burn because of our unrighteousness. We're going to burn because we kill babies and we have a government who says they're Christian, but yet they funded 500 million more dollars. Let that sink in during your lunch hour today. Why don't you pass it on to your stiff-necked friends who think that this president and this administration is so praiseworthy of Christianity. I wouldn't even eat a dinner meal with that man. Let me tell you the blunt truth. I wouldn't fellowship with a murderer. I wouldn't fellowship with somebody who sentenced innocent babies to their death. And that's exactly what took place. I don't like all the other millions of dollars, including the total 1.3 trillion. I don't like where it went. I don't like the lies that are taking place. I don't like being lied that we're going to build a wall and not one zero, nada, for all my Mexican friends, nada will go towards that wall. Do you see how you've been duped? Do you see the lie? 
Jesus is the only truth. Those watching right now, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today's the day of salvation. Now's the time to get right with him. If you're backslidden, been sitting on the fence, not sure about the things of God, God loves you and God has a tremendous plan. Even though this message is hard and it's harsh, and I know it sounds more doom and gloom, but there's hope in Jesus Christ, and hope comes in the form of a warning. So I pray that you receive Jesus today. Father, I love you. I bless everybody watching today. I pray those that don't know you would get born again. Those that are still blind that their eyes would see. And Father God, we wouldn't worry about a revolution. We'd have a revival in you. I pray let truth go. As inadequate as I feel this morning, take these smooth stones, Lord, and let them hit the mark and bring down this Goliath of deception that is not only in our political system and media, but also in the house of God. I thank you for it, Father, and I'm honored to be able to do what I'm doing. In Jesus' name, everybody say Amen. I love you. I'll see you all Wednesday.